The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, in the third chapter and the 17th verse. The 17th verse in the third chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your ruler. Now, that's obviously a part of a larger whole, a larger statement. And most of you here tonight will remember that it is indeed a part of that sermon that was preached by the Apostle Peter in Jerusalem. As the result of the miracle that was worked on a certain lame man by Peter and John. In the early part of the chapter, we are given an account of how this poor man who had been born lame a man over 40 years of age who had never walked in his life, how they used to take him every day and put him to sit on the pavement outside the beautiful gate of the temple. And there he used to ask alms of the people who went into the temple. On this occasion, Peter and John, fresh from Pentecost, were walking into the temple at the hour of prayer. And this man suddenly asked alms. But... Peter, we are told, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he did. And he went walking and leaping and praising God into the temple. Indeed, this man was in such a state of exaltation that we gather here that he was clinging uh, to Peter and John, these two men who had given him suddenly this power which he'd never had in his life. We are told in verse 11, as the lame men which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. A congregation gathered, in other words, as the result of the miracle and there they were. Peter, seeing his opportunity, begins to preach. When Peter saw it, he answered unto the people. Then we get this sermon. It begins in verse 12 and goes on to the end of the chapter in verse 26. I'm not reading it all again, but I must read the first portion in order that you may have the context of this 17th verse in your minds. Listen. You men of Israel, says Peter, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? As though by our own power or holiness we had made this men to walk. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his Son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was detained determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his holy prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. And the sermon goes on. Now, we are looking at this sermon together. And if I remember rightly, we are doing so for the fourth consecutive uh, Sunday night. Now, why are we doing this? Well, we are doing this, of course, because it is a sermon, one of the first sermons ever preached under the auspices of the Christian church. Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost, but here he preaches again. And I am directing attention to this because uh, here we have an authoritative declaration as to what the Christian message really is. Now, we're living in an age in which, alas, 
there is unutterable confusion with respect to that very thing. You notice the Apostle Paul in writing there to the Ephesians exhorts them no longer to be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by cunning craftiness and sleight of men whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Well, if that was true in the first century, oh, how true it is tonight. What is the gospel? What is the Christian message? What is the business of the Christian church? There is greater confusion, I believe, about this than about any other single subject at the present time. And that's why I'm calling attention to this. We are living in an age when any man gets up and gives his own opinion as to what he thinks Christianity is. New Reformation. Their ideas. Who are they to speak? What authority have they got? If you want to know what Christianity is, then I suggest that in sheer honesty, apart from anything else, you're in duty bound to come back to this book of the Acts of the Apostles. What do we know apart from this? This is how it began, and all our faith is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and here's one of their leaders speaking, the first spokesman. This and this alone is Christianity, and everything else that pretends to be is a lie. The lie of the devil to mislead men and women. My dear friends, I speak strongly, I speak feelingly. Why? Well, for this reason. That I know that there is nothing under heaven tonight that can save a man. Nothing that can ever put this world in order but this message. And because there is confusion about this, I say, it is the greatest tragedy of all. And so, you see, Peter takes advantage of this opportunity. The crowd has gathered because of this phenomenon, the healing of the lame men. And Peter begins to preach. And as I've been indicating, he does a most amazing thing. He does something which is so different from what is popular today. He doesn't preach a sermon on miracles. That's what we do. At least that's what many do. Have a discussion about miracles. In this scientific age, are miracles possible? And you have a learned discussion as to the possibility or not of miracles. Peter refuses to do that. He says, why look you at this? This isn't the thing. It's brought you together, but don't look at that. And he says, don't look at us either. We are not just miracle men. We are not just some kind of magicians. We've got some occult power. Oh, people are very interested in the occult and all these weird and odd things. All right, if if you've got the time, well, it's all right to be interested in these things, these extrasensory perception phenomena. So, no, I agree, very wonderful. But, you know, that's not the business of Christian preaching. This is how Peter handles it. He said, don't look at this, don't look at us. Well, what are we to look at? Well, he says, look at him who's made that and this possible. That's the thing. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. The God of our fathers. The object of that and the object of us is to make you look at him. And what? Well, to consider his great plan and purpose and scheme of salvation. You know, says Peter later on in the sermon, the prophets have foretold all this. He says he has spoken about this by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. He says again, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken of likewise foretold of these days. The prophets have foretold it. But then the hour had struck and God had sent forth his son His holy child Jesus, his son, his servant Jesus, this holy one, he sent him into the world. And he had lived a perfect life and he'd spoken and had taught. He'd kept the law of God, but above all, he had gone to the cross. Those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. He expounds to them the meaning of the death and the cross. 
how that is God's great way of achieving this great reconciliation and salvation. He goes on to tell them about the resurrection. God raised him from the dead. He tells them about the ascension, that the heavens must receive him, that he's there, seated at the right hand of God, and how he's going to come again, and there shall be a restitution of all things, how the whole cosmos is to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now then, we've been looking into all that. That's the essence of Peter's sermon and of his preaching. But now the question arises, doesn't it, at once? In the light of all that, that amazing, extraordinary thing, this power that can heal a man born lame and send him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. These astounding events. In the light of all that, the question that arises at once is this. Well, then why doesn't the whole world believe this? Why isn't everybody in Great Britain tonight a Christian? Why now not men and women like the lame men, walking and leaping and praising God? Why is not the whole world at the feet of Jesus Christ tonight, worshipping him, adoring him, and following him whithersoever he chooses to lead? Why? That's the question. Why is it that the whole world isn't Christian? Why doesn't it believe this message and submit itself to it, I ask? Why doesn't it rejoice in this great hope that is set before it? For all these things are fact. Why is it that so many in the world tonight, yea, the majority, are not interested in Jesus Christ at all and dismiss him and especially dismiss his death upon the cross and his shed blood and don't believe in the resurrection and certainly don't believe in his second coming? Why is it that he's still being rejected as he was here in the first century? Well, now, the answer, you see, to all that is given in this 17th verse to which I'm calling your attention tonight. And this surely is the most important and urgent problem that any men can face at this moment. With the world as it is, I say, and this gospel, why doesn't everybody run to it and fly to it? And the, the answer is given in one word. And the word is ignorance. And now, brethren, I what? I know. I am aware of the fact that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. What's the main problem in the world tonight? It's the same answer. Ignorance. This is the central problem of mankind. Ignorance. Now, I want to look at this with you. Let's look at it. Let's listen to the apostle as he puts it here. Let's see how this is the great theme, in a sense, of the whole of the New Testament message. Let me, first of all, note what an astounding statement this is. And uh, if it was astounding in the first century, it is still more astounding, in a sense, today. There's nothing that the world is so amazed to hear as the fact that its greatest trouble is ignorance, especially 20th century men, especially mid-20th century men. Oh, men come of age, scientific men, men of knowledge, educated men, whose attitude is this, isn't it? That it was all right for his ignorant forefathers uh, to believe this gospel, as it is still all right for some benighted savages, uh, perhaps, to believe it. But to ask a modern, intelligent, educated, scientific man to believe this gospel, why, it's insulting to him. Why? Well, because of his knowledge. What he knows, his understanding, his brain, and his intellect. Isn't that it? And yet, you know, this old gospel still comes to us and it tells us that the main trouble in the world tonight is ignorance. And indeed, it is very simple for me to prove that this is still true and the right diagnosis. Doesn't the state of the world prove that this is true? I mean this. 
If man knows as much as he claims to know, well then I ask, why in the name of God is his world as it is? If we are so clever, so knowledgeable, and we've got science, we've got psychology, we've got social studies, we've multiplied our education and facilities. Don't misunderstand me, my dear friends, I'm not here to oppose any of these things. Thank God I received a little education myself, and I'm grateful for it. It's all of help and value. All I'm trying to show you is this, that clearly that is not enough. And I'm in this pulpit to testify that it wasn't enough in my own personal life. And it's not enough in the life of any individual tonight. If this knowledge that we have and which we boast so much of is adequate, well then I ask again, why is our world as it is? Why have we had these wars in this century? Why are they piling up these terrible instruments of death and of torture? Why the tension between nations? Why all the troubles? Why all the difficulties in our own society? Capital, labor, master, servant. Why the disputes in families, the rivalries and the jealousies amongst people who've been brought up together? Oh, why all the things that make life so tragic? Why does any individual fail if it's, if it's the knowledge that they possess that really is what is needed and it's adequate? Why does any man go down to the same sin repeatedly? I'm asking this question. Can anybody dispute this diagnosis that the main trouble in the world tonight is ignorance? You see, not ignorance about how to conquer the force of gravity. We've got that, we've done it. Not ignorance how to invent gadgets, microphones, Electric light, press buttons, everything's done for you and you just sit down and enjoy yourself looking at the television while the washing's done and the cooking's done and everything else is done. Oh, we've got all that knowledge. It's all right. We've, we've got it. But you see, that's not the knowledge I'm talking about. What am I talking about? Oh, I'm talking about the knowledge of how to live. The knowledge of what man is and what he's meant to be. The knowledge of how to resist temptation. The knowledge how to go straight and to be clean and pure and wholesome. The knowledge of how to die without a fear. The knowledge of what lies beyond. These are the questions. You see, these are the problems that make life what it is. It isn't all this other knowledge of which we talk so much. That doesn't help a man how to live. The problems of living and of life are exactly the same today as they've always been, in spite of all this vast knowledge that we've accumulated. You see, all the knowledge that we have and of which we are so proud, it doesn't help us with the fundamental problems. The fundamental problems of the individual, the fundamental problems of society, for society is nothing after all but a collection of individuals. And it is at this point that the world tonight is proving that its main trouble is still ignorance. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance he did it. Very well, then, let's go on and let's examine this. What are the causes of this ignorance? Here's the vital question. And I again assert that there is no more urgent problem facing every individual and the whole world tonight than this. What is the cause of this ignorance that stands between us and the salvation of God? And fortunately for us, that's dealt with not only here by the Apostle in a very brief way, but elaborated still more in the further teaching of the New Testament. What is the cause of the ignorance? What's the thing in men that makes him reject the gospel as these had crucified Christ and had shouted with the crowd, away with him, crucify him. What's the cause of it? Well, let me give a, ne a negative answer first. It isn't a matter of intellect. It isn't a matter of brain power, capacity for reason or understanding. Because that is what the modern man says. The modern man says he is not a Christian because of his great brain and his great intellect. The only people who are Christians are fools. Laughable that anybody should be a Christian. 
A man of intellect and understanding, a man of reason and of ability. Of course, it's almost an insult to ask him to believe such a thing. Now, you see, that is the central fallacy. And Peter, in a very interesting way, deals with that. He says, and now, brethren, he's speaking to the crowd, you see. And now, brethren, I want that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. This is wonderful. He points out, you see, that intellect has got nothing to do with this at all. If it had been only the rabble that had cried away with him, crucify him, well, you could say, of course, the rabble never does understand. The majority are always ignorant. But the discerning people, the people with discrimination, the people with brains and understanding, they never do such a thing. But, of course, we happen to know from the accounts in the Gospel that the common people shouted away with him, crucify him, at the instigation of the ruler, the leaders of the people. It was the Pharisees and scribes, the doctors of the law, the Sadducees, the priests. They were the people of all others who instigated this rejection of the Christ of God. Not only the common people, but the rulers. And this is a point that the New Testament makes so frequently. The Apostle Paul, in his way, puts it, In writing to the Corinthians, you see a calling, brethren, he says, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He says again in the second chapter of that first epistle, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so it goes right through the whole of the argument of the New Testament. This gospel has always been foolishness to the Greeks. Stumbling block to the Jews and to the Greeks sheer foolishness. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But the point I want to emphasize is this. That Peter here in this pregnant phrase uh, disposes of this whole argument that a man is not a Christian because of his great brain. He says it isn't only you but your rulers also. And the modern man needs to be told that. What the modern man says is this, isn't it? He says, of course, I'm a man who reads, and uh, I'd go go to a place of worship and sing hymns and have a little bit of sob stuff on a Sunday night. I'm a thinker, and I listen to the great men on the television. I see the great philosophers and the great scientists, and none of them are Christians, and I'm not a Christian for that reason. They're people of brain, so am I. They've got great intellect, so am I. That's my reason. But you see, what he forgets is this. That for every great intellect that rejects the gospel, there is probably at least a thousand people who haven't got intellects at all. You did it, so did your rulers. It can't be a matter of intellect. You see, if it were a matter of intellect, all the people who haven't got great brains would believe the gospel, but they don't. Indeed, one of the greatest tragedies and problems in this country tonight is just this. And every Christian should be tremendously concerned about this, that Christianity is rapidly becoming something that only applies to the middle classes. And the majority of people in this country are right outside and uninterested. Not because they've got great intellects. Not because of their scientific knowledge. They haven't got it. No, no. The ordinary people and the rulers unite in rejecting him. It's got nothing to do with intellect at all. Well, what is it? Oh, the answer is quite simple. Unfortunately, it's not the state of the head, it's the state of the heart. And ultimately, you see, it comes back to this matter of pride. Oh, how these people showed it so plainly. And their rulers. If you want to know why people reject the Son of God and cry away with him, crucify him, make a study of the Pharisees and the scribes and those doctors of the law and the Sadducees in the four Gospels. And then you begin to get at the answer. Not mine, no, no. That, you see, is proved by the fact that the common people also are in the same position. Not only the Greeks, but the barbarians reject him. Now then, you read about those people in the Gospels, and what will you find? Well, you watch them. Look at their malice. Look at their bitterness. Look at their spite. 
Look at their malign cleverness, trying to lay traps for him. What had he done to them? He'd come to do good. He never hurt any one of them. We read of him as smoking flax. He will not quench the bruised reed. He will not break. But look at all this antipathy. Look at all this vituperation. And indeed, it's brought out in a very striking way here by the Apostle Peter. He says this to them. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Here's the Roman governor, far from being a godly man, but at any rate an intelligent man, and he felt he must have some sort of reason for condemning a, a, a prisoner, and there was no, nothing at all. There was no case, there was no evidence whatsoever, and he was determined to let him go. His wife had had a dream, and it had terrified her. She'd sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with this just, this just man. Don't be guilty of his blood. And Pilate did everything he could to set Christ free. But they wouldn't let him set him free. Now, what explains that? Is this a matter of intellect and calm, uh, dispassionate reason? That's the picture, isn't it? That those of us who are Christian are just sentimentalists and emotionalists. We don't know how to think and we don't know how to reason. But they, the non-Christians, they've got these cool brains. Brains in an icebox. Never moved by any emotion whatsoever. They look at things objectively, dispassionately, and calmly. And as the result of their wonderful scientific assessment of the facts and the situation, they reject it. Well, all I say is this. Why did they press the common people to shout away with him? Why did they fight against Pilate when he was determined to let him go? What is this spirit that's in this? What's this hatred, this antagonism? That's the cause of the trouble. How do you explain it? That is the explanation of the ignorance. Indeed, you see, there is evidently an element of perversion in all this. These people preferred to have a robber delivered to them. You denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. My friends, I ask you as intelligent people, have you ever considered this question? You've got to. You've got to explain this. Here was a generation that preferred a robber and a murderer God's holy, only begotten, just son. That's your problem. What makes men do that? What makes them do it with malice and hatred and spite? They mock at him, they jeer at him, they taunt him as he dies in agony on the cross. This feeling, this passion, this vituperation, that's the explanation. You see, it's got nothing to do with an intellect, but it's got a great deal to do with the heart. The apostle brings this out, as the whole of the New Testament does. Oh, the explanation, of course, is quite simple. They felt like this about him because he condemned them. He hadn't come to condemn them. He kept on telling them that. He says, the Son of Man is not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What's the matter then? Oh, I'll tell you what the matter was. These authorities on the law, these experts, these able men... They suddenly saw this carpenter, the men who'd never been to the schools, an apparent ignoramus, and yet he was able to teach in a manner that they couldn't. They could just quote their authorities. They looked up their textbooks. So-and-so said this, that one said that. Here's one who speaks with authority, not as the scribes. And they hated him for that. And then he taught them, and though he didn't directly condemn them at first, they understood his teaching, they were intelligent all right, and they saw that his teaching condemned them. He made their righteousness, of which they were so proud to appear as filthy rags, and they hated him. He eclipsed them as a teacher, he eclipsed them as a person, he eclipsed them in all his pronouncements. And they hated him with a holy hatred, especially when he said, you must be born again. And when he said, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. 
The Son of Man is not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And they hated him, and they killed him because of it. Now then, you see, it is primarily a matter of the heart. But that isn't the only explanation of this ignorance. Let me take you to the second factor. The apostle here in verse 19 says, Repent ye, repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Sins. In the last verse, 26, I read this. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Oh, my dear friends, this is the cause of the trouble. Sins and iniquities. What are these? Oh, these are transgressions of God's holy law. These are our violations of the law of our being and the law of life. These are our deliberate refusal to live as God intended men to live. Sins, missing the mark, falling short of righteousness, doing that which is evil deliberately, delighting in it and glorying in it. Sins and iniquities, what do they do? Well, this, in a way, is one of the great themes of the Bible. Sins and iniquities always blunt and affect the every single faculty that man possesses. Indeed, I can sum it up by putting it like this. The case of the Bible, in a sense, is that ever since man fell, he's never been able to think straightly. He's muddled. You cannot go on sinning and preserve your faculties. Now, that's a theme in itself, I know. I'm only just glancing at it tonight in terms of what the apostle says here. But you know, that was the whole trouble with the Jews at the time of our Lord. Listen to the apostle Paul putting this in the second epistle to the Corinthians and in the third chapter. He says, you know, the trouble with my fellow countrymen, the Jews who have rejected Christ and the gospel is this. Their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. That was the tragedy of the Jews. They were proud of their scriptures. They said, we alone have got these oracles of God. Those Gentiles, they're ignorant. They haven't got the oracles of God. We've got them. But you know, says Paul, they don't understand them. They're blind. There's a veil upon their hearts. They can't think straightly. They've been like that for centuries. They're still like that now. And all this, you see, is the result of sin. When men fell, all his faculties fell with him. And man has never been free since he fell. Free thought, free thinkers, library. There's no such thing as free thinking. Every man is a creature of prejudice. Isn't that the cause of all our troubles? Look at the outcries today against certain acts of this government. But then remember the outcry against the acts of the previous government. Not the same people in the outcry, but each one looking at it entirely from his own standpoint. Prejudice. The other man's always wrong. I never see it in myself. That means we're not thinking straightly. Nobody can look on dispassionately and with a free mind. No, no, I read that portion to you from Ephesians 4 at the beginning in order that you might have this great psychological analysis of men in sin. Listen to it again. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, listen, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. There's nothing to add to that. You see, what he's saying is this, that because man is a sinner, all his powers are blunted and vitiated, and the more he sins and is guilty of iniquity, the less straightly can he think. The heart governs it and prejudice arises. He's out to defend himself at all costs. He's a pervert. 
and he's a creature of prejudices. And that is an additional reason why he rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want the third and the last explanation, it's this, and it's a terrifying one. The Apostle Paul, he was a great preacher and evangelist, and sometimes he seems to have been disappointed at the meager results of his preaching, so he takes up the question in 2 Corinthians 4, in verse 3, where he says, If our gospel be hid, if men and women are not seeing it and are rejecting it, if there's still ignorance, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. This is why men and women don't believe in Christ in the 20th century as in the first, not because of their great brains, but because the devil, the God of this world, hath blinded their minds has bludgeoned their minds, has them as captives, and they're not free. They're not allowed to believe it. Lest they believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Well, my friends, there is the explanation of the ignorance. I wot, brethren, that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers, and that is the cause of the ignorance. But let me hold this before you in the third and the last place. What is it then that the unbeliever is ignorant of? What is it that 90% of the people of this country tonight are ignorant of, these people who don't even claim to be Christian? Oh, my friends, I've been arguing, and I've been arguing I trust because of a holy indignation and sense of righteousness at the way in which the devil confuses the minds of people. I want you to see it for what it is, but I speak with compassion. Oh, the tragic ignorance of the world tonight. Oh, the needless unhappiness. Oh, the needless pain and sorrow. The world is as it is, and it's in an agony because it's ignorant. What is it ignorant of? Well, let me just give you some of these great answers. Work them out for yourselves. The world is ignorant of God. That's the central trouble of us. Our Lord, in his last prayer that is recorded for us, his great high priestly prayer, he put it like this. O oh, righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these, pointing to the disciples, have known that thou hast sent me. If only men and women knew God, the God of glory, the God whose name is love, the God who is righteous, the God who is holy, the God who is light, and in whom is no darkness at all. If the world but knew God, oh, that's the tragedy, that's the trouble. Men and women think God is against them. And if anything goes wrong, they say, why did God allow this? I mean by that, people who've never thought of God. They'd never go to a place of worship. You let something go wrong. Why does God allow this? If there is a God, what? Oh, what's the matter with them? Oh, the trouble with them, I say, is that they don't know him. They don't know the only true and living God. If they but had some glimmering of an understanding of all his divine and holy and eternal attributes, the whole world would fall down before him. You see, the whole world has listened to the lie of the devil. He came to the original parents and he said, Hath God said... Can't you see, he said, God's trying to keep you down. If only you ate of that apple, you'd be like God's. Your eyes would be opened. Ah, oh, they said, he's right. God's against us. And that is the greatest folly of all. That's the tragedy of tragedies, and the world is still like that tonight. It doesn't know God. But come, man not only doesn't know God by nature, he doesn't know himself. 
He doesn't know his own state and condition by nature. He doesn't really understand his essential problem. Man doesn't realize that he is as he is and his world is as it is because he's a sinner. It's the only explanation. Of course, iron curtain. The people on this side say it's all due to those people on that side. But you know, those on that side are saying exactly the same about us. That man Hitler, we said. And Hitler said, no, it's those grasping Western nations that having conquered the whole world themselves and having taken a lot of it from us want to hold on to it and they've no right to it. We must have Lebensraum, living room. And that's the same with every quarrel and dispute, isn't it? Man doesn't know that he's a sinner. He doesn't know that he's got a sinful nature. He doesn't know about this blindness that I've been speaking of. Man thinks that he's all right, really. Of course, he says, I don't claim that I'm a hundred percent saint, you know, but that's it, isn't it? He really is a good fellow. And he says the troubles are due to the fact that I'm not really being given an opportunity to show what a good fellow I am. So you see, this must be put right, that must be put right, and that must... Then if all these things are put right, we shall all be right. No, no, man's too big for that. I've said it before, I say it again. Thank God you don't make a man a new man by giving him a new house. Every man is entitled to have a decent house. But the fact that you put him in a new house doesn't mean he's a new man. He'll turn it into a pigsty if his nature is that of a pig. Man doesn't know himself. He's content to think of himself today as just a reasoning animal. And he thinks all he needs is food and drink and sex and clothing and motor cars. God have mercy upon us. Man doesn't realize that this nature of his has gone wrong, that he's twisted, he's perverted, he's vicious, he's vile. Read the seventh chapter of the epistle to the Romans. And there you'll hear the great apostle telling us the truth about himself. In me, he says, that is to say, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The law is holy, but I am carnal, sold under sin. What's the matter with me? With my mind, I recognize the holiness and the rightness of God's law. But I find another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law that is in my members. I don't know what I am. I'm a fool. I'm right. I'm wrong. There's excellency in me. There's that which is ignoble and vile and ugly and foul. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me? Man doesn't know that, you see. The modern man doesn't know that. He thinks he's all right. He simply needs more money, better conditions, better environment, better circumstances. He hasn't yet come to the knowledge that even Shakespeare possessed and he wasn't a Christian. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. And man is ignorant of that. What else is he ignorant of? Well, he's ignorant of the fact that there is a final judgment. And that he's moving in that direction. Of course, we're all interested in life, and it's right we should be. But it is equally right that we should be interested in death. Every one of us has got to die. You don't expect governments to address you on that, do you? All right, I'll agree, it's not their prerogative, but it's mine. They're very interested in as to how you're able to pay for your funeral. But my dear friend, I'm much more interested in this. How are you going to die? The disposal of your body is not the great question. The great question is the destiny of your soul. For according to this book, it is appointed unto all men once to die and after death the judgment. Man is a responsible being under God 
and God observes him and God will judge him and every man of us, every one of us will have to give an account of the deeds done in the body whether good or bad and people don't know that, they're ignorant of it they're living for the hour let us eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die and death is the end, they say it's sheer ignorance I what that in ignorance he did it as did also your rulers the rulers don't know it any more than the common people. The rulers are desecrating the Sabbath as much as the common people. And it's all the result of ignorance of man's soul and his ultimate destiny and that he stands before God in judgment. And if he dies in sin, that he goes on to eternal misery and unhappiness. The world doesn't know it. It couldn't go on as it is if it realized it. This is what Peter preached. Repent, he says, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The world doesn't know that. And then, you see, that leads to the next thing. It doesn't know that it needs a saviour. That's why the world rejected Christ when he came in the flesh and that's why it's gone on rejecting him. It doesn't realize it needs a savior. He came and he said, Come unto me, all ye that are weary or labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And they said in a sense to him, What are you talking about? We've got life. He was preaching on one occasion and he said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then said the Jews unto him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, You shall be made free? They said, You're insulting us. We are freemen, and we've always been freemen. The world never realized its need of a savior, and it still doesn't realize it tonight. Men think they can reform themselves. They can reform their world. They don't realize their weakness. They don't realize their utter helplessness. They don't realize the uselessness of all their works. But I'm a good man, says somebody. I'm a moral man. If I were a drunkard or an adulterer or a wife, Peter, I could understand your argument. But I'm a good man. I'm a philanthropic man. I'm always out to help my fellow men. I'm doing good and I'm living to do good. Oh, my dear friend, you don't know what you're talking about. You're ignorant. Look at this man, the Apostle Paul, one soul of Tarsus, righteous Pharisee. A man living to please God and to carry out the moral law as he thought. And he says, I excelled over everybody in my obedience to the law of God. It was all ignorance. Because when he met that Lord of glory on the road to Damascus, he suddenly saw the value of his supposed righteousness. He says, I count it as loss. I count it as dumb, as refuse. It's no good at all. It has no value. Re-echoing the sentiments of the old prophet, all our righteousness is but as filthy rags. Man in his ignorance compares his goodness with some obvious evil lying in the gutter. What he needs to do is to compare his goodness with the goodness of Jesus Christ. He said... Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Righteousness! Man hasn't got it, and he'll never produce it. There's nothing he can do. He's vile, he's lost, he's helpless, he's hopeless. He doesn't know that, so he doesn't see his need of a savior. But as Peter goes on to show, he is in this appalling ignorance because he really doesn't understand his scriptures. He is ignorant of the scriptures. He says, all the prophets from the beginning of the world have spoken of these days. These people were without excuse. They were Jews. They had their Old Testament and they read them and they listened to the preaching on them every Sunday in the synagogue and they thought they were experts on the scriptures, but they didn't know them. These scriptures spoke of these very things. Or as Paul put it again to those Corinthians, when Moses is read every Sunday, they're blind to it, they don't see it. 
The veil is there. Or as our blessed Lord put it on that famous occasion when he addressed the two men on the road to Emmaus. You remember the picture, don't you? These two men were going down from Jerusalem to Emmaus after the resurrection. The women had come back from the grave saying that the grave was empty, that Christ had risen. They didn't believe them. They thought they were mad, that they were idle tales. And the two men were walking down the road in utter dejection and unhappiness, completely disconsolate. And this stranger drew near to them and began to talk to them. He said, what's the matter with you? They said, haven't you heard what he said? Haven't you heard about Jesus of Nazareth? What about him? Well, we had hoped that it had been he that would have brought deliverance to Israel and brought in the kingdom. Oh, but he's dead, he's buried, and it's all come to nothing. And you remember our Lord began to speak, and this is what he said. Oh, fool. Oh, fool. And dull of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ, the Christ to have died and suffered these things? And then he began to expound the scriptures to them. You see, the world is as it is and as these people were because they're ignorant of this revelation of God. We are left without any excuse at all. It's all here. It's all open before us. And yet people are ignorant. They're blinded by the God of this world. But oh, let me hurry on. This is the height of the tragedy. That the world is ignorant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, brethren, says Peter. I know that it was because of ignorance that you did it. You crucified him. You spat upon him. You cried out with the crowd, away with him, crucify him. You did it all. Why? Oh, just because you were ignorant. You didn't know him. It's the same thing, you see, as Paul says again, the rulers of this world didn't know him. And what a tragedy this is. The great men of the world. The princes of this world, the great philosophers, the great scientists, the great everything, the great kings and princes, they reject him. Why? They didn't know him. For had they known him, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The thing is almost inconceivable, isn't it? But here was the Son of God standing in the flesh. Oh, what must his face have been like? They had the privilege of looking at him and looking into those eyes of love, that holiness and that purity. They saw his miracles. They listened to his teaching. They didn't recognize him. They missed the splendor of his person, the accents of his voice, the purity of his teaching. They couldn't get it. But oh, above all, how they missed the glory and the wonder of the cross. It's all because of ignorance. They thought they were killing him. They thought they were just getting rid of him, but it wasn't, you see. That, according to Peter and all the New Testament, was this. Those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. They mock him and jeer at him. They don't know what's happening, what is happening. Oh, what's happening is this, that God's plan worked out in eternity before the very creation of the world is being put into practice. What's that? Oh, it's this. God is taking your sins and mine and is putting them on his own dearly beloved son. Oh, what love. He is taking your guilt and mine, putting it onto him and punishing him in our stead. The most glorious thing that ever happened. They didn't see it. They didn't know it. They were completely ignorant as to what was happening. That holiday crowd in Jerusalem, mocking and jeering and laughing, the joke. And there God was doing, I say with reverence, the greatest thing that even God could do. He was giving up his only begotten son to death and to the grave. He was smiting him for us. He was making this glorious way of salvation. They didn't know that, and the world still doesn't know it. If they did, they'd join Isaac Watts in saying, When I survey the wondrous cross, 
on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss. Listen, and pour contempt on all my pride. They don't know that, and they're ignorant of the glory of the resurrection. What else? Oh, the world is ignorant tonight of the blessings of salvation, the very blessings that it stands in need of. What are men's greatest needs? Here they are, forgiveness of sins. When you're hemmed in and in a tight corner, when the world has failed completely, what can you do? You say there's only one thing left, I must pray. You remember how during the war we used to read of those poor fellows who'd been torpedoed in a ship? And they got out into their little boat or their little dinghy and there they were 13, 14 days on the ocean. No sight of help or of relief. Food finishing, water finishing, everything gone. What shall we do? There's somebody said, let's pray. But how can a man pray? How can a sinful man who hasn't thought of God for years suddenly go into the presence of this holy God? His sins are between him. Something's got to be done about them. The greatest need of men is forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God. But here it is offered. That's the blessing of this gospel. Christ died that we might be forgiven, that your sins might be blotted out. And the world doesn't know it. It's ignorant of it. And it's ignorant of the new birth, the new life. Look at that poor man who's a slave to a sin. It's ruining his life, ruining his reputation, ruining his family, ruining everything. He's tried, he's exerted his will, he's made his vows, his resolves, he's done everything. He can't. And the world can't help him. What does he need? Does he need education? My dear friends, some of the most educated people in the country are the greatest sinners in this respect. It's in Oxford and Cambridge they're peddling these drugs. No, 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 no. There's only one thing that poor fellow needs. He needs a new nature. He needs a new heart. He needs a nature that will love the light and hate the darkness. Instead of loving the darkness and hating the light, he needs to be made anew. He needs to be born again. It's offered him in the gospel. He doesn't know it. It's ignorant. Are you still ignorant as you look at the world, as you look at your own life, as you look at history, as you read this word? Are you still ignorant of God? You are immortal soul. And in between, God's own Son, Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior of the world. God forbid that anybody should go out of this service still in ignorance. Let me plead with you in the words of Peter. Repent! Think again! Ere it be too late. And turn to him quietly. Now, as we sing the next hymn, And in a moment of silence afterwards, turn to him and say just this quite simply. Lord, I was blind. I could not see in thy marred visage any grace. But now the beauty of thy face in radiant vision dawns on me. Tell him that. And he will receive you. And you'll be with him in the glory everlasting. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org. 
www.ghostbusters.org.